My name is Beryl Blake, and I am an elder here at Harvest Bible Chapel in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's Good Friday, and I want to share with you some thoughts from the seven statements of Jesus Christ while hanging on the cross. While hanging from a cross on Calvary's hill, Jesus uttered seven powerful statements that revealed his heart and ministry to us. Each statement carries the weight of the gospel in itself, but together they provide a portrait of God's eternal plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. This portrait reminds us that nothing but the finished work of Jesus Christ will assure our eternal salvation. First, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus did not ask forgiveness for himself. He didn't need to. He was sinless. Jesus did not ask for a quick, painless death. He knew his purpose for dying on the cross. Jesus did not ask God for vengeance on the people who sentenced him to death. Instead, he prayed on their behalf. Even in his suffering, Jesus was able to forgive his tormentors and cared about their souls. If Jesus could forgive those who hurt him, friends, he can forgive you, and he offers you that forgiveness. And also, he gives us the strength to forgive others. Secondly, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 23. In one of his final interactions, Jesus extended eternal life as he openly forgave others. Jesus sparked an internal transformation in the criminal next to him. Our Savior did not allow his own suffering and torment to distract him from the cries of faith from a repentant sinner, just as he was not too preoccupied to minister to the criminal, he is never too busy for our concern. Thirdly, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. Luke chapter 19. Jesus' first two statements clearly reveal his divinity, his power to forgive sin and to grant eternal salvation. His third statement reflects his humanity as fully God and fully man. Jesus' concern for Mary was not just as a savior, but as a son. His compassion for his earthly mother reminds us that Jesus also cares for our well-being and direction in life, even when we don't understand God's plan. And as Jesus asked John to care for Mary, he asked us also to care for others on his behalf. He told Peter to care for his sheep. And in many passages of scriptures, we are told to love one another as he has loved us. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In fact, that is statement number four. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is in Matthew chapter 27. This prayer is the very heart and necessity of the cross. It is the fulfillment of the prophecy from Psalm 22. For the first time in eternity, the son knew the wrath and the judgment of God. Our sins were poured out on Jesus and God could not look upon him carrying our sins. This separation from the Father must have been even more agonizing than the physical torture, yet he suffered it for our sake. He was forsaken so we can be received. God tortured, God turned his face away from Jesus so he can turn his face towards us in compassion. The greatest agony of our Lord was not so much the pain of the nails, but being, but rather being forsaken by his Father. Equally, the greatest suffering of an individual who has rejected Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord will not necessarily be the fires of hell, but the absence of God. I thirst. After enduring unthinkable stress, 
three days of imprisonment, trials, floggings, and crucifixions, the, and crucifixion, the Son of God who made the waters thirst, experience extreme dehydration and thirst. In this statement, Jesus fulfilled another prophecy from Psalm 69 and verse 21. Still, there is a deeper meaning to his thirst. Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Jesus cried out with the psalmist. He was thirsting for the presence and fellowship of God the Father during their separation on the cross. Jesus' thirst on the cross was not for physical water, but for the souls of men. His greatest satisfaction, according to Isaiah 53, verse 11, in the King James Version, which reads, He shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. The cross meant more to Jesus than his freedom, because it is through the cross that lost sinners will be saved. That's why Christians glory in the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Luke chapter 23. This cry was not the cry of defeat, but a cry of victory. It was not the cry of being conquered by death, but of conquering death. It was not a cry of a person who was a victim of circumstances, but, but one who is in control of his circumstances. As a commander who would dismiss his servants from his presence, Jesus dismissed his own spirit and went to be with the Father as he spoke the words of Psalm 31 verse 5. When the centurion at the cross witnessed Jesus' victorious cry, the officer recognized the difference between Jesus and every other dying man he had seen. It was in this moment that he said, Surely this was a righteous man. Jesus was no ordinary man. He was the God-man. God who became man so he can save man. He had accomplished what he came to do, so he was returning as he came. He was not defeated by death, but was victorious as attested by his resurrection. It is finished. John chapter 19. How many times in the Gospel of John does Jesus talk about his hour? He would say, my hour has not yet come. Oh, the hour is coming. It was as if Jesus was hearing the chimes of a clock that nobody else could hear. The life of the Lord Jesus Christ the sum total of his ministry and mission was leading to this one final cry. It is finished. From his birth, through his boyhood, manhood, and public ministry, Jesus' focus was to finish the work his father had given him, the work of redemption. From the very beginning, Jesus' death and resurrection were God's plan for our redemption. If you have not experienced the finished work of the cross of Christ, you can today. Right now you can say, it is finished. Lord God, I commit myself to you. I surrender my life to you. I know you have conquered sin and death, and I accept your gift of eternal life. For believers, Christ's final cry should be a constant encouragement that we do not need to spin our wheels or worry about the future because his finished work secures our glorious and eternal destiny as children of God. Yes, Jesus Christ died. But today, yes, today we know that he is alive. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fears are gone. Thanks for joining me. I am Pastor Verrill Bake. May God richly bless you and enjoy the rest of the day. You are loved.